So welcome everyone to tonight's lecture. My name is Joan Du. I'm the Dean of the Daniels faculty. I want to thank you all for attending tonight's lecture, both of those of you who are in the room as well as our audience online. Um, this is the first hybrid lecture event of 2022, and we look forward to hosting more of these in the near future. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Tonight's lecture, entitled A Place for Life, and Archaeology of the Future will be delivered by Lena Gautmey. This year's Daniels faculty, Frank O'Gary Chair in Architectural Design. Named in honor of Frank Gehry, this endowed chair brings an acclaimed international architect to Toronto, to the Daniels faculty every year to teach our students, to share with our faculty, and to give a public lecture such as tonight. The chair honors one of the most esteemed architects of our time, a Canadian who was born not far away from here in downtown Toronto. And now on to tonight's lecture. Lena Gautme is an award-winning architect whose Paris-based practice is currently creating wonderful projects around the world. She was born in Beirut and graduated with distinction in architecture from the American University of Beirut. Lena's design for the Estonian National Museum competition in 2006 won first prize, which led to her establishing her first partnership practice to realize the project in the Estonian city of Tarfu. Since then, she has been recognized internationally and won numerous awards for her, uh, for her built works. Over the past couple of years alone, Lena was awarded the 2019 Prix Pierre Cardin for architecture and the Schelling Architecture Prize 2022. And recently, Lena's Stone Garden Residential Complex in Beirut won the Deason Award for Architecture Project of the Year. Congratulations. Over the course of her two semesters here at Daniel's faculty, Elena's studio in the Masters of Architecture program has been examining the impact of the 2020 port explosion in Beirut on the surrounding urban landscape. A reflection of her office's research-based approach to creating a more resilient community through a close examination of history, context, and people. We look forward to the students' projects and the final review discussions in April. Lena calls her office's work an archaeology of the future, drawing from a vernacular past to build a new speculative future. It is this way of working and thinking motivated by deep humanism and a desire to build a better future that Lena will elaborate on tonight. I welcome and present to you, Lena Gomez. Thank you so much, uh, Jin uh, Ju, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I'm especially honored to be uh, Gary Chair for this year uh, in, uh, in UC Daniels. It's really, just adjusting meanwhile, <laughs> uh, it's really uh, wonderful to be uh, among you here and to be able finally to travel. I took out my mask. I think COVID doesn't travel so much distance, so it would be fine. Um, and uh, yeah, and to, to be present here to meet my students, we've been doing exciting work and I'm looking forward for the, uh, for the finals. So uh, today uh, I want to talk about the, the process of work in our practice, 
thinking about uh, the, the process of designing, but also uh, like tackling projects that deal with difficult situations. We find ourselves more and more today working in uh, traumatic and post-traumatic landscapes. And we wonder what's the role in architecture of architecture actually in that context. Uh, so one of the things that we start always uh, looking at is Earth. We're living in Earth. And yesterday I was having a conversation with one of my students. And uh, she said, actually, uh, that uh, it's, it's amazing what's happening in the world is concerning because as students, we, as soon as we start a project, we start from Earth, from Google, and then we zoom in into uh, the context. So actually, we're, we're one, and we have to think about the place where we're uh, designing especially that humanity has become a dominant force uh, in shaping uh, the world. Uh, and that in 2020, uh, we all know that uh, the human uh, mass has been uh, exceeding uh, the biomass on Earth. And that we are actually, uh, we already uh, like exceeded the, the tipping point. Just a few uh, days ago, actually, the, the report of the Jack uh, went out, and it is quite concerning, quite worrying. But we we may and uh, we should think that we're able to kind of change the way we uh, we do things, maybe by thinking about what constitutes us, because we're actually more microbes than humans, and the human cells only constitute forty three percent of our total body. So we're always thinking of how much nature and architecture as such, if we are nature as humans, how much can we encompass nature and architecture? And how can we think about an environment that links to its context, that talks about this tight link with earth, with like instead of building and putting an object in place, starting to emerge it from the ground, Thinking of architecture like a discovery, like uncovering uh, a place, emerging uh, a story that links to, uh, to an environment, but also talks about evolution, an evolution of a typology, an evolution uh, of uh, history, but like a link also to the place where we're building. So in uh, our practice, in my office, we uh, really work with different medium. We're trying always to research every project as a question. We start with thinking about the context, but also questioning the typology that we want to build and trying to reinvent it every time. So moving from ideas that start to take uh, like the shape of this kind of cloud of uh, concepts to images, to models, and this kind of uh, like constant movement between different medium of work. And the hand plays an important role because it links us to our environment. It's linking the body actually to the act of constructing and of making. So in a way, architecture is positioned between uh, archeology, span future, nature, and the humanity. And thinking about these four uh, points, um, maybe archaeology is bringing us uh, to history, to the act of digging. Humanity is about inclusion, about like thinking about society, about craft, about the relationships that we are trying to, to build when uh, making architecture, nature, how nurturing uh, architecture could be or how linked uh, to, to its environment, how does it dialogue with its context. And every act of architecture encompass, uh, in a sense, a newness to it and originality. So in a way, it forecasts a certain new way of being and of inhabiting. I would tackle like five, six projects more uh, closely and starting with this uh, museum in Estonia. I start with this project, especially when I'm presenting at schools, because this is a project uh, that is a competition. 
uh, that uh, I won with two colleagues of mine in 2006. And at that time I was uh, 26 years old and it was just an open competition uh, that uh, was uh, in Estonia uh, and it's in Tartu. So it's the cultural capital of Estonia. And Estonia was under Soviet occupation until 91. And the museum is uh, an ethnographic, ethnographic museum. So it's a collection that they've been collecting over time uh, to construct their identity through the objects that they are collecting. And it's this kind of wooden objects, but also these uh, textile works that they've been doing and uh, that uh, uh, amazing artists actually have been uh, working on as a way of resisting these times of occupation and of building their identity. So this artist, Anu Raud, is also a part uh, exhibited in that, inside that museum and does these wonderful textile works. I just put some uh, like books that you can see bit by bit in the presentation. So as soon as I move on and for Estonians, uh, they wanted to build their house. So they don't call actually this museum a uh, museum. It's their house, but it's a large house. It's like 40,000 square meters house in Tartu. And it's uh, this site that is very um, surprising when looking at the competition. There is this kind of large airfield that just crosses the site in the fringes of Tartu, which is the cultural capital of Estonia. And the idea that we proposed for that building is instead of sitting alone, independent of its site, is to just come and like die into that landscape, die into that airfield and continue it into the field of the museum. Drawing a new history actually in a certain way to the Estonian people, but also to the uh, site itself, to the surrounding. So here we see this drone moving along the building. Uh, and as it, the building disappears from one side, it reappears on another part, opening up to the uh, to the context and inviting the public into the entrance. So this uh, like land, uh, let's say uh, airfield actually that just crosses the site uh, is the one that we saw in the uh, drone movie is just covering the landscape and uh, in the competition brief uh, the uh, like the jury didn't actually talk about that airfield and actually we understood why because this is uh, like the place where many manifestations had happened in Estonia this is like a land that is just crossing in the side that continues all the way and scars this landscape and all the Estonians were doing their manifestation for independence uh, there on that uh, like airfield, which was one of the largest military airfields in the Baltic states, uh, like ex-Soviet airfields uh, at that time. And so Estonians like didn't really want to talk about that history. But then again, how can architecture deal with the history and at the same time take into consideration that land and transform it? And hence the idea that the museum could become like a, almost like a land art or like a continuation of that uh, land and to take it into its own realm and transform that platform into a place where uh, Estonians could write their own history and rewrite it on that ground. So it's a place for appropriation where people could gather. Uh, it's a place actually that became uh, like a pretext for people to gather. And that was when all the Estonians came together to put the first stone on the museum. And we see how the airfield is starting to get the dust and the museum emerging at that time, almost like as if it belonged to that place. And even during the construction, the building started to talk about the site, like with this large cantilever that is tested, like we test the airplane wings. And then moving from that large scale 
to give back this human scale into the building. And uh, all the functions were like uh, contained into these smaller scales of uh, uh, like uh, spaces that uh, talk about the scale of the city and bring back uh, the museum into the human scale. So in a sense, the, the building is starting to transform its site. It disappears at one point into the airfield. It just reappears again and dialogues with that context. And it, the, it actually talks about also that uh, climate, which is this uh, minus, getting minus 20 in winter time. Of course, for me uh, at that time, I was more of a Mediterranean. So I was like discovering cold and how to design in a cold climate. So thinking about a building that could be uh, leased uh, in its maintenance, that is double skinned with a triple glazing that doesn't consume a lot of energy. At the same time, that uh, facade becomes a play, like um, expression also of these uh, motifs that talk about uh, the uh, like uh, local uh, ethnographic uh, motifs that uh, that all the, that that actually uh, the clothing uh, were uh, designed with, and that become uh, like a gown for the building itself. And inside the, the space, uh, the, the question was to bring this kind of uh, generosity of spaces inside that building, where the spaces of uh, life become the spaces between the different functions, between uh, a boutique space, uh, like the uh, shop of the museum, and other uh, like functional spaces. So creating spaces of engagement and uh, in a way fighting for these generosities of spaces where function is not defined. These are what I used to call uncertain spaces that become just places in between uh, different functions and that become actually the, the heart of the whole life of that museum. And we could see how uh, Estonians started to, be, to do all their performances actually on, in these spaces between a library. And as we see here, all the library is made with um, like local uh, wood material. And the exhibitions, uh, and here the exhibition design was done by local uh, architects. Uh, but what's interesting is also this bridging between digital and physical in uh, the exhibition spaces, making these uh, places, places for education, for uh, Estonians to uh, like new generation and young people to spend their time in that building. So it's really like a lively uh, incubator of culture where people meet and uh, spend uh, time in. And the building transforms with the landscape, like moving from uh, the winter time into summer time. And like also uh, in, the, in the way it, uh, it sits and it expresses itself as an architecture, changes with the weather. As we see here, it dies into the landscape and becomes also a place of celebration. So the spaces that are empty spaces or the voids become potent. And here, for example, this airfield becomes a place where uh, they do uh, large um, uh, like concerts. And that was a concert for Metallica. I don't know if you know still Metallica, but we know it. <laughs> uh, some of the uh, other performances.
So basically, uh, transforming the museum into a tool as well for uh, cinematographers and producers to appropriate spaces that are unexpected. And as we saw this uh, lady knitting actually uh, inside the structure of the beam. So after the museum was completed in 2016, I was curious to uh, uh, like to hear from people, like what did they think about that building and the, the museum uh, conservators and uh, seeing how can architecture actually dialogue with them. And one of the uh, museum like staff was saying that we waited 70 years for, uh, for building our own national museum and that that was uh, like part of the history that we were uh, constructing and it's uh, like a place uh, where we we are actually testing our grounds and trying to see what we are capable of designing. And it's also a place where it becomes a great and a great challenge to move and adapt to new qualitatively different environment and uh, where Estonians still have hope and fears. And uh, hopefully uh, the uh, wonderful artists should be happy with this building. And in echoing uh, with the uh, like events that are happening today, I would like to uh, also uh, like kind of underline a solidarity with the Ukrainian people who are living very difficult moments at the, like in the current times. And makes me remember that project that we worked uh, on, which was a competition that we submitted uh, a few years back. And it was building on uh, this event, uh, the Euro Maiden uh, like revolution protests where the uh, Ukrainians uh, were in the street trying to protest against uh, uh, like a political decision uh, that uh, hindered uh, their agreement with the European uh, of trade with the European Union and how architecture also becomes a tool to commemorate certain moments and certain moments of history where uh, Ukraine got its independence in 91 and uh, again got this revolution in 2014 and struggled for, for that uh, independence and how the like architecture could also serve an act of remembrance at that point. And the idea was to commemorate the moment of uh, these protests that happened in Euromaidan and try to build a project, a museum that uh, draws on that moment, but also culminates in the heights of the city. In a way, echoing the landscapes in uh, Ukraine and trying to echo these through a form of architecture. And the idea here was to kind of a build a uh, building that uh, like talks about this movement in the street and uh, like more provide for platforms where people could uh, be in the city rather than a container for art, culminating like a, uh, like a mount in the city and trying to provide spaces that open up to the uh, to the city exterior. Uh, and the same time, as you see here in this image, is like this kind of uh, uh, ground that uh, that lead the public upwards. And the exhibition is a place where all these remainings actually of the revolution would be exhibited inside, like allowing for these double height spaces within that building, trying to express that in different medium and moving to like uh, model work and trying to see how how to express with like different kind of tools of work as well this idea of uh, of the ground moving up in france uh, when we're also talking about uh, moments of uh, change and about climate change uh, this project that we're leading in the 13th district in Paris is a call. It, it was a result uh, and um, a proposal uh, that came uh, in result to uh, a call for innovative projects for, from the city of Paris 
but also uh, like a question on how architecture can deal with uh, global warming, but also with the, like different program that could deal with sustainable feeding and the whole waste that the, the, the world is living in uh, today in terms of uh, food and to instigate a sort of change, maybe a kind of possibility for ending the Anthropocene. And the project is uh, really like set uh, in this around this railway station that crosses uh, Paris next to an old station uh, that is uh, derelict at the moment and where the train used to pass in the heart of uh, the city of Paris. And the idea is to deal with the food, sustainable feeding, and to think of a building that not only talks about architecture, but where as an architect, we can also think about the whole program of that building that would be orchestrated around the, the question of feeding, but also a place of research, of innovation, of sharing, and of reuse. So how to sustain a whole cycle in, uh, in the architecture of that building and think about the circularity, the circular economy, even in the shape of the building itself, where one could be uh, like planting, living in that place, transmitting, uh, cropping, and then again, like the cycle could uh, turn uh, inside even the, the, the functions of that uh, project. But also thinking about an architecture that is not anymore about the stacking of functions, but that initiates dialogue and connection between the different floors and where there is always this interrelation between the different uh, people that live in that uh, building, creating moments of surrependicity, like where people could meet and uh, like unexpectedly inside an architecture. And of course, it's a building that tries to use biosourced material, like in that case, uh, wood construction, uh, trying to talk about also the uh, surrounding and the neighboring uh, buildings that are also constructed in wood, because we know wood stocks carbon, so we reduce our carbon footprint, especially if we are also like using wood in a sustainable way from eco-sourced forests and from a local for like closer to Paris uh, forest building in wood and I think that is a common practice in Canada allows um, actually to be low in carbon but also to think about building in assembly but also in disassembly and in, in a manner when we are constructing we are thinking about also reusing the material if such a building is dismantled. At the same time, it's about reusing the material of the building itself, but also of the content, like agriculture, how can we recompose and have this kind of circular economy inside the building, creating multiple stories in that context. And moving from the uh, like actual envisioning of that project into like testing it and model, and this is a model that uh, we did during the competition to show how the building functions and how it relates to its environment. So we have places where uh, like uh, schools in, uh, that are dedicated to agronomy in, uh, in France would set their uh, like uh, laboratory in that uh, building and having an urban agriculture within uh, that tower place where one could live like within this kind of uh, uh, construct around circular economy having a place where uh, like uh, people could dwell in that context uh, places where like of interaction with the neighborhood and also allowing this building to live more than an hour almost like 24 hours as a place of life So I'm moving here to uh, Beirut, and here we move to the con a more challenging context in terms of the uh, stability of that context, like the war that it had lived. And for uh, this building that we delivered in uh, Beirut, just in the port area, and we're very close to uh, the silo that uh, was um, like ex that exploded uh, a few uh, two years ago. 
Uh, and we are in a city that uh, lived many histories, one of them the Ottoman times, where we can see these uh, old houses that constitute the history of that Mediterranean city, houses that have been uh, really subject to destruction as well, like the lack of uh, conservation in that city. And where we see also how, uh, like, like the city is a bit of a testimony of how uh, urbanization is transforming the world, where we could see the history being erased by the new towers emerging, like uh, different uh, uh, layers of uh, construction and uh, like transforming the, the, uh, the urban fabric. And in that sense, there is a sense of emergence from history, uh, like the city that had lived from uh, the ancient time to the classical time with the Romans, and then the colonial period, uh, like moving into the Republic of Lebanon in 1943, and then again, uh, like the Ottoman times, and how how to build in that context where like it's almost like a constant palimpsest. And it always unveils itself as an open archaeology where nature is intertwined with that uh, like history and with the archaeology that unveils itself. And it's a place also that uh, invites one to constantly make and make as an act of uh, learning. And this is an interesting book uh, by uh, the anthropologist Tim Ingold and uh, who talks about actually how uh, making is really uh, like part of the act of uh, learning and also intertwining like archeology span with art, with architecture and anthropology as essential fields that are interconnected. So this building is really located uh, in the port area, so at the fringes of the city center that was reconstructed in 98, started like, uh, like its reconstruction in 98, and that was completely destroyed after the war. The reconstruction was uh, very contested because uh, the question was how to deal with the history and the uh, was it uh, and actually questions of memory of heritage of of the life of that city center were uh, a bit absent in the reconstruction of that part of the city and this building also was a story uh, with the encounter of uh, with Fuad Al-Huri, who is a photographer, and who took uh, photos of Beirut in '92 with uh, like uh, other uh, series of photographers like Gabriel Basilico, and actually it was really a striking contrast to see how the city got completely transformed, losing all what had happened uh, during the war. And we thought we would never see again these photos. Unfortunately, we're still seeing them uh, currently all over the world. And we see like how the city got transformed, but also how the body actually uh, of us as a human being becomes uh, like almost one with the environment when as, it, as our environment transforms, becomes frail. And we can see how also this uh, kind of situation echoes uh, archaeology, at least for me, I can see how this kind of notion of the ground is completely like uh, present in that uh, uh, like moment of, uh, of uh, like destruction or like transformation of the environment. And in Beirut, in that sense, the act of opening uh, becomes very much charged with the politics, but also with the memory of the city. So in that sense, that building uh, was uh, sculpted like an urban mass that responds to the uh, urban fabric itself. Sorry, I'll just do that because it's uh, moving all the time. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Ah, okay, because I can just feel my uh, voice going in and out. 
Yeah, so moving from uh, like the urban mass of the project and then thinking about the openings, how to uh, like open in that context where the opening is not anymore about just uh, viewing the outside, but becomes a device uh, to question actually the city, but to bring it in a different manner also to the inside. So here we see during construction time, I was taking these photos uh, of the uh, of Beirut and how the uh, opening becomes almost like a, a staging the outside, but also tracing actually moments in the city, like how uh, we we see these buildings constantly uh, destructed and reconstructed, and the trace is constantly present as part of the uh, physical reality of that city. Yet also uh, one element that is important is how that how can nature be part of uh, architecture, but also be part of it in the way it is present in the city and its organic presence, as we see it in these ruins, where like it, it just comes in and builds on on a ruin in an organic way in an, a free way as well. So in a way, the openings become openings for life, uh, places uh, where uh, nature could grow and different scales of nature become also part of the scale of a building. So these large openings are places where a tree could grow and smaller openings are ones where smaller gardens and uh, like flower pots could, uh, could be grown. And these become part of the way we interact with the city, but also in the way uh, like uh, the house or like the uh, like apartment could uh, uh, be uh, in, in the city itself. So these are some of the views in the apartment where nature is part of the uh, like uh, planters and part of the balconies of these uh, of the building. And there is also a sense of questioning of the way to build in this um, context and this uh, climate and Mediterranean climate where it's quite hot in uh, summertime and maybe learning from that past and from the vernacular to kind of find a new form of tower in that context. This is not only glass tower, but that talks about uh, the measurement of the opening in relationship to its context. Uh, but also moments of vernacularity and the way we interact with the outside. So the facade of that building talks about also the emergence of an architecture that is linked to the uh, ground in which it emerges. And it's this experimentation uh, of uh, plastering techniques that are co commonly used in that context and trying to uh, rethink these with the hands of the artisans in place uh, thinking about uh, sculpting the whole building, combing it as if it's an earth that uh, like emerges vertically, thinking about the, the power of the hand and the making a vibrant matter, but also like echoing uh, Johanne Palasma with uh, like the, the uh, eye of the skin and how we can bring back the, the hand as uh, a part of the act of making. So we started the office uh, working with these uh, small uh, clay models, uh, like I started actually with a fork, trying to, to work this material and moving from there, devising that comb that is uh, designed on the scale of the building uh, on 3.5 meters high and installed on rails and then combing the whole facade with these uh, numerous uh, like uh, combs that we manufactured and uh, where the artisans also were become, become actually part of the making of that building as well. And in that sense, the building also like tries to uh, talk about its context. It, uh, it really uh, scales down and really takes the expanse of, uh, of the ground on which it sits. Uh, and as we see here, like it changes uh, morphology, uh, like according to the way, uh, to, to the different sides. And here we see the um, uh, south facade and this facade is bound to be covered at some point because of the urban regulation that allows the buildings to go higher. 
And the idea was to kind of position these smaller windows that open up to kitchens or to uh, uh, like uh, washrooms uh, within the side of that building, but also echo in that sense, the history and the memory of the city. So the skin tries to talk about this context, somehow disappearing at some point also with these constant sections that we see in the city of Beirut. And inside, uh, like one enters like almost like in a womb, uh, like this, uh, like this is the lobby of the building and the leading into uh, this art uh, foundation that is a row space where artists could express themselves and uh, it's a platform like non-profit organization actually a uh, platform uh, for artists in the Middle East and photography uh, to be displayed. In that sense, actually, like building from uh, the history of the city, uh, the, the building after the blast, uh, like surprisingly, uh, like withstood that uh, explosion. Partly uh, we, we see this uh, silo that protected also this part of the city, but at the same time, this whole building with this finish and uh, nature was just uh, standing resiliently in that context. Uh, of course, all the windows were completely shattered, but I wondered like how maybe when one is thinking about uh, a context and the building in relation to that context, there is a sense also of resiliency to the architecture in that uh, manner. So the, now at the moment, the building is being renovated and uh, we see nature like growing really uh, nicely out of these uh, openings and uh, maybe taking over that uh, project until it's inhabited again. And if I have more time, I will continue. With this, uh, like moving this, to this project uh, in uh, Normandy in France, and it's a leather workshop. Uh, and here we're trying to push our boundary into sustainability by uh, building the first uh, passive uh, low carbon uh, building in uh, France, like dedicated to manufacturing. Of course, a manufacturer will uh, spend a lot of energy. And we thought how to be efficient in that building, how to make it sustainable. Talk about the hand, talk about this kind of uh, like precise act of making and this kind of micro scale uh, of uh, relationship between the hand and the material, whether leather or at the scale of architecture, the materiality of the building itself. Uh, trying uh, to talk about the trace, uh, the trace of the hand, but also of time, because it's a place of making, of manufacturing that is uh, like made to grow, to, um, uh, to, to be also a tool, a tool actually uh, for the people to make, but also a tool itself that is able to grow as a place, as a building. So we started thinking about the system actually of architecture and uh, the system of a grid that uh, could constitute uh, that uh, building uh, and that could become a grid where uh, that is flexible, that at some point uh, generates spaces of encounter, but could sit on its side, but allows moments of growth as well. And in a context that is uh, very uh, specific in Normandy, where it rains a lot, it's quite moist. And to, to really reconnect to that uh, like earth and to the ground in which it sits. So talk about the, the life of that uh, environment uh, and be a lively uh, place itself. So it's a building about like to, that sustain uh, also itself and that is thought of uh, in, in the first hand as a bioclim in a bioclimatic way. So it's really compact in its uh, structure. It's positioned in an optimal way in relation to the wind direction, the sun direction, really taking into account the resources in a just rudimental way, but also uh, using tools uh, like with our engineers to, today to calculate how to position best the building in its site. And realizing that through these just uh, 
initial act of positioning in a more sustainable, more bioclimatic bio way, building, we reduce uh, our need uh, for energy. We reach more closely our comfort zone uh, as a human being inside that building. And then there was a moment of uh, recalculating the energy uh, needed actually to provide uh, to make that building function and trying to, with our engineer, to uh, like uh, divide that types of energy and what consumes most in the building itself and moving to think of how we can actually use more clean energies to uh, be able to provide uh, like the uh, electricity for that building. So from uh, gas, uh, uh, like uh, based uh, energies to uh, geothermal and uh, photovoltaics. But still, of course, when we're using such uh, means of energy, calculating our carbon footprint and trying to lessen in terms of uh, footprint, uh, our impact from a classical building. So in terms of material, like thinking about how we can source a material, thinking what, what can be present in place and if we can use uh, local materials. And we discovered that very close to the site, there were these uh, brick makers and artisans working with the um, local uh, uh, earth and uh, producing these uh, wonderful bricks. And we decided to revive one of the uh, brick artisans and to work uh, with bricks as a mode of construction. Uh, and going back to the idea of the craftsman and echoing Richard Sennett's uh, book and calculating the impact of brick in terms of carbon footprint, and we ended up uh, more virtuous than uh, building with concrete. And then after like taking all the materials that we will use in that building and calculating one by one the carbon footprint of every material to reach a more uh, like a lesson uh, carbon footprint uh, for the building itself. So bit by bit, through technology, through the work, uh, like close work with uh, our engineers, but almost with the vernacular also approach to the architecture, trying to kind of reach that uh, lower impact and uh, to reach this passivity for the building itself in terms of energy consumption. So here was a, like a venture to meet that uh, brick maker, understand how the ovens work, these traditional ovens that uh, work in a circular manner. And uh, it was really nice to kind of see how we can actually use the earth that is in place and move from that to these 500,000 bricks that uh, were manufactured, baked, and uh, that start to scale the building itself and bring back actually the, the building to the scale of the hand and that of the, the brick that becomes the element that orchestrates all the modules of the, of the project itself. And the natural uh, shape actually of spanning in uh, brick construction is uh, the arch. And we started thinking with, the, uh, with our structural engineer how to optimize the material used in terms of bricks and to allow the best uh, spanning actually of, uh, of the arches. And funnily enough, uh, as we research, actually the idea of um, the uh, like uh, uh, like raison d'être of Hermès came back actually, which is this kind of uh, uh, horse saddlery and the gallop of the horse that actually is echoed in the form of these uh, arches as well. This is the model we produced and now the building is under construction. So we see like this kind of very thin arch. Oh, it's got uh, that, uh, you can't see. And maybe I can conclude here. So I thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, maybe you can have a seat. Can we have the light on the stage? I had a few more slides, but I, I think it's good to start the <laughs> conversation. Well, thank you for sharing this latest project. All right. I think you can leave the slide on. Yeah. Oh, can we keep the presentation? Yeah. Please. We're in. I think it can animate our debate. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if we sit, if we, if I sit a little bit away from you, maybe I can, we can take the mask off. Yeah, I think. I think this is two meters. Yeah. Some someone yeah, have we'll a get some someone have a scale. <laughs> it looks like a meter forty-five. <laughs> How many architects does it take? <laughs> We're properly social distanced, I think, in this room. We're I think I'd definitely below fifty percent capacity. So although perhaps can you sit this way a little bit? I'd like for you to be more in the light. Yeah, yeah I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to get the measuring thing. The, the tri <laughs> <are, are visual. laughs> it's an architecture lesson 101 you gotta know what's two meters <laughs> thank you so much lena for that wonderful talk um you you shared some of the slides when we had a brief online um, lecture last term and um today you showed us a few more projects um the museum entry for Ukraine is new. Uh, yeah. This is the first time I've seen that. Um, perhaps we can start there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today I had the pleasure to meet a few of our students from Ukraine in the faculty. Yeah. And it was um, very sad, but also wonderful to meet them. And they are in their, you know, there's one that's in the second year undergraduate, there's one in the first year at Mark, and one just finished defending her doctoral thesis three days ago in her sixth year of PhD studies. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're here, Victoria, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so I encourage them to come to see your talk tonight. Um, to really, you know, I shared a bit your background and your contribution to the city of Beirut post-explosion, but also the museum at Batarfu, um, not shying away from revisiting a past mm. and a history that is perhaps painful mm. and, and understanding that a way to avoid these things that happen in the future is not to pretend it didn't happen, but really to to examine it and to reflect it and to continue to discuss it, either through discourse or through architecture. So I want to thank you for your 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 talk tonight and so much of what you've shared. Not only you know was it relevant ten years ago. You know, six months ago, it's especially relevant today. And that's just a really um, a poignant talk, I think, that is especially meaningful today. Um, so thank you very much. And I, I'm sure our students, um, whether they're from Ukraine or Russia, would appreciate the, the, the conversation. And in my conversation with the Ukrainian students, we discuss the tragedy that's happened in the Ukraine, but also the hardships they face here, uh, and also the hardships faced by the Russian students that are in the faculty in the university. Um, these type of wars and destructions in many of the sites that you have worked on, um, the, the cost is basic human lives, regardless what passport you hold and, and what language you speak. 
And I'd like to hear from you if you could share with us a bit more of how you were able, um, whether it's the, the, the museum project in Tarfu, the museum competition entry in Ukraine, and also the project in Beirut. How were you able to examine these often very painful and conflictual and political situations through design and architecture? What, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced? Mm. Uh, because often, especially these days, there um, are our students, whether in Canada or around the world, there is a sense of helplessness. You know, the, the world has so many problems. It wasn't created by them, but they have inherited. What can they do uh, about this? Um, because I very much see a sense of optimism in the work, despite the very extreme environments you've been working in. And it would be great if you can expand on that a bit more. Yeah, I think, yeah, thank you so much for your words. And uh, it's, I think we, we uh, somehow it feels like we're living in a cyclical time. We, th we think the time is linear. And uh, I think you, you have a better philosophy of time than we do. <laughs> like this notion of uh, cyclical time where, where things are interrelated and uh, our actions are interconnected. So uh, the more we move forward, we see how, uh, like whether we talk about the environment, uh, we talk about the climate change, we see how our actions really come back in, uh, in a certain way, in the, in the way we inhabit our, uh, our context, or uh, questions of unresolved issues re related to war, uh, or questions of territories, of uh, like boundaries are questioned today, and question the construct of how our system is, uh, uh, how, how do we inhabit this planet, actually, the fact that we're all separated by boundaries is still it's it's quite still a, one world yes yeah. exactly so i think like uh, growing up in beirut in a context of a uh, war city uh, i i lived that actually i i grew up with that context and never was aware of that context so it challenged me also as a citizen but also as a, with my desire and actually built up my desire to become an architect because in that context as a young person growing up my my desire was to to bring people together actually to think about can space actually be a, a mean of uh, of maybe uh, uh, healing in a certain way, but also of bringing people together, of uh, thinking the way our relationships could be fostered in a different way. The pleasure of space is also a mean of, uh, uh, of like thinking about our environment uh, differently, of being uh, uh, more, uh, of seeking more well-being, the way we articulate our relationship to the outside, instead of building boundaries, maybe thinking of a porous boundary, uh, with uh, of with our context so these questions accompanied me actually in in Beirut but uh, I think it's really about also empathy like when one is uh, building in a certain context like being aware how important the the fact of building is of making uh, a space in a certain uh, place uh, and of uh, like instigating that belonging, that respect to an environment and being empathic with the, with the people that live in that environment, trying to listen as much as possible to the complexity, a field of complexities actually that surround us. Because in a way, architecture kind of like bring together all these very complex uh, disciplines, fields, politics, uh, visible and invisible dynamics that constitute a, a, a space and uh, like uh, bring them into synthesis in, in a, a space. So as an architect, you have to constantly be able to, to hear, to listen, to, to feel uh, people and try as much as possible to integrate that in, uh, in the, the way we design and the built environment. 
but I, th I think also thinking uh, in a modest way that we cannot, we're not saving the world either, that when we are building, we're also having an impact in, uh, in that context. Uh, like any act of construction is also in a certain way destroying a certain uh, like existent manner. So always being able to critically question oneself and uh, try to uh, push one's boundary in every way of making. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I remember the last time we had this conversation, I, I had an observation uh, that the, the architectures that you created, especially the, the stone garden in Beirut, it, it, it's um, it's very paradoxical. It's very light and very heavy. It's very futuristic, uh, but at the same time, it looks like mm. very ancient. It looks like it could have been there already for for you know decades. Um, there is absolutely a, a sense of openness, but it's also very solid. So it is seems to me the architecture um, is full of tension mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps that is a reflection whether you're consciously aware or not uh, of um, your own development and your own thought as a person and and how that was you were shaped culturally mm -hmm. and and that how that does manifest itself through the works that you do mm -hmm. um, that is quite quite fascinating and you know the thank you for sharing i haven't seen images of this latest project in france it's it's beautiful i can't wait for us to be able to see its completion i'm sure you as well um, this also uh, exhibit those qualities right it it looks like it could have been there it looks like a, an as found uh, archaeological site if you will um, yet there are so many aspects of it is very speculative. It is very innovative. It is, um, you know, I think charting a new direction for us when we talk about architecture and sustainability and carbon and your energy. Um, this does not look like a lead, <laughs> lead green <laughs> building. Design. Yeah, it does not look like a net zero low carbon building. This, um, yet I firmly believe this is the direction that we should also go as architects and designers uh, to continue to explore the role of architecture and design in creating sustainable buildings and cities. Mm -hmm. And it seems really consistent with your work that you have always tapped into a local craft, a local tradition, a local ways of making and I think for me that it's not coincidental that that is also a way that you have found through this architecture um, to combine the, the technological methods that as architects and, and designers that we're using in um, measuring and assessing, uh, making more efficient, but also learning from this tradition of the brick kilns and, and the, the, the local earth that's been there, I'm sure, for centuries. Yeah. And for me, um, for me, that's not the coincidence because I also agree there's still so much we can learn yeah. about sustainability in its true sense, mm. not how lead defines sustainability, mm. but sustainability in the basic sense of making decisions making buildings today that really still leave resources and and leave energy and leave greens and clean air for the future generations and and I, I think it's not a surprise many of the local crafts and and local ancient customs wherever they you they are whether it's in in France or here in Canada the indigenous practices um that has lasted through decades and centuries I, you know I, I do think that that yeah. is absolutely a source yeah. and you know it, it'd be really wonderful to hear you to expand on that a bit more about how you think in in through, through the, the few projects it's been consistent how have you found 
you, you know, in, in lectures, you show us where these two things come together. Yeah. So the kind of this technological understanding of carbon accounting, uh, triple glazing, low E glass, and a, a local craft of brick, how they come together. But I'm curious to hear where do you find them in conflict? Where do our current practice of thinking about what is a green building, what is a sustainable building, how is that in conflict with some of what you have found through your own research with the local crafts, through your own design, where the two actually um, would conflict and how do you make a decision mm -hmm. through design in that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Like I think the the sometimes they like the two uh, approach could uh, conflict. Uh, I would say the uh, the difficulty is more the the way regulation is uh, regulation urban regulation. Like, uh, building regulation is uh, is constructed that for example at the moment we're trying to develop uh, um, housing buildings in uh, Paris that are more low carbon that are more sustainable in the choice of material uh, and uh, the the issue is the regulation because regulation is all set for concrete construction and uh, once we start to experiment in biosourced material suddenly we're uh, tapping into a regulation system that does not allow actually to to build with other material. So we start to uh, struggle in that sense to push the regulation and to be able to build high denser project with more sustainable material. And, uh, and I think the challenge also like to, to kind of change the mindset in that sense that to, uh, to be able to also allow the building to uh, like construction process to be more flexible in the sense of learning while making. Uh, for example, in Beirut, the project, uh, like the whole experimentation of the facade uh, was part of the building process. I couldn't define everything in the beginning. So that was also part of trying to find what is there, discovering the place, trying to implement what's in place. In uh, Normandy, it's really like uh, also the challenges of building with brick going back actually to technique with masons uh, that uh, we, we couldn't find anymore. Masons actually that are able to, to construct a structure in uh, bricks. Uh, the, the, we had to form again uh, the, the masons to construct in uh, bricks. So, so it's really kind of bringing the past, like our knowledge on the past, projecting that into uh, like the future in the sense of uh, like bringing again the know-how, readapting it to the techniques of today, but also changing the regulations and trying to make these evolve to be able to, uh, to, to experiment more, but uh, with actually material that exists centuries ago. So it's kind of seeking more flexibility and more like uh, uh, that all the organisms that are involved in construction could move along towards that process of more sustainable construction. And that's the, I think, the challenging part that as an architect, you're not alone actually building. You have to like move together with all that kind of uh, system that is established and how, how you're able to maneuver around and make uh, the system also evolve along your process. Yeah, and the um, yeah. French systems <laughs> are anything but flexible from my yeah, they, they recollection. Time, they work time, there. for example, the project that uh, in the 13th, the tower uh, mm. in uh, Paris, it's a wood building and uh, I won the project uh, four years ago and we're still not, not now got the permit we were like struggling to uh, uh, with different organization now the regulation on wood construction had just changed completely so all the structure had has to be covered with another material for fire regulation which yeah. is completely absurd because it increases the carbon footprint of the building at least the structure itself so we're recalculating the whole project to see how yeah, to which def defeats the purpose of a timber structure in yeah, the first place exactly yeah. so so i mean it's just 
needs a lot of patience and uh, somehow balance with uh, other projects. But I think also there's something that about like, we, we cannot achieve uh, always a neutral carbon footprint for all the functions. One of the projects that maybe just to go on with the slides is this dance theater that we're doing in um, Tours, which is in the south of uh, Paris. And it's established uh, in place of this old, uh, like a military barrack. I don't know why I end up always in such places. <laughs> this is military <laughs> barrack, and it's about dance. And here we have to build a project that spans, you know, like it's a dance hall, so it cannot be built. Uh, with the other than concrete. So here concrete has to, uh, is employed actually to use these kind of, uh, to make these large spaces. And, and then we're trying to make the facade with more material that could be in that case, uh, uh, bricks again, and talk about this kind of uh, movement with the facades and uh, articulate that through the architecture. So I think, also, as, as we move on, we cannot just be strict in the way we build and uh, just uh, if we have to cater for dance spaces, for spaces that have a certain uh, volume, we still have to also use the right materials in that context. Thank you, thank you. I do want to leave, um, I, I want to give a chance for anyone in the audience that may like to ask Lena a question. And I know there are also possibly questions, Jason, online as well. Um, perhaps, Jason, you can select a question from the Zoom uh, audience. And then those who are, to give a few minutes for those who's in the room to, to see if any of you would like to, uh, to ask a question. And you're gonna have, if you do have the question, you had to stand up because it's very glaring. I can't see you. Yeah, oh, Jason, you go okay, it. thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions from the Zoom, and the first one is from uh, Lawrence Franklin, who is asking if you could comment upon the role of the developer, the development industry, and land use planning, and the land use planning process in shaping the building in Beirut, which you discussed. Uh, the developer, I think the project, um, every architecture project to be able to make it a successful one is a venture with a client, with a developer, with a constructor. And uh, I think that the, that was uh, really an exceptional work to uh, like our collaboration with the uh, developer and the, who happened to be also the constructor of uh, the building that was willing uh, to trust the architect that was willing also to experiment along me on this facade and uh, that went through that uh, process actually of uh, uh, of testing uh, together and uh, the whole uh, kind of venture become became actually a, a common story and a common uh, joy to, to make the building and also at the origin of that uh, project is uh, for Adel Khoury, who is a photographer and who also wanted, like didn't, uh, you know, impose uh, a vision on a project or restrictions. So he also trusted uh, me as an architect with my team to develop the, the, the project. Uh, and yeah, the developer Rashad uh, Dernaya is, uh, is called uh, Red Development. They really did the amazing work for that uh, in that matter. Great, thanks. Uh, is there someone in the audience that would like to ask a question? Otherwise, Jason can ask another question from Zoom. Oh, you go, go ahead. Can, can someone pass a mic? There's someone in the front row that has a question. Uh, no, it's better you speak to the mic so those online can hear your question as well. Uh, here. Yeah. Good evening. Like, do you hear me? Sorry. Hey. Or should I call you Miss Gomez? And so I have a question about the project in the, uh, Beirut. So uh, other than the other project you showed tonight, so the most of the facade of the architecture was made by the material itself, for example, the wooden structure that arranged in a specific way. But what is the moment that made you to do the decision to use the handmade craft on the 
uh, Belarus facade. So what made you to do this kind of decision for the facade? Would you mind explain that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the, the moment uh, I think started when I uh, started my clay models. My, my clay models, basically, okay. like the small mock-ups and the offers. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that moment, when touching the material, actually, oh. and working with the fork and trying to kind of uh, work the material, there is an emotion that emerges, actually, with the link with the materiality itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the, the fact that, um, like, wanting to achieve that and trying to to see what are the different techniques. So we went through like, for example, the molding mm -hmm. and you see how uh, like uh, almost soulless it is because it becomes very plasticky when uh, you mold the, uh, the concrete or it's tiling and then you have all the joints. So then the, the question, like the desire was to bring back like this the same emotion that happens when you do your model actually and bring oh. it back to the scale of the mm -hmm. architecture itself, mm -hmm. but also working with the uh, workers in, in place, like the artisans, and uh, feeling like, uh, or wondering how can they be part of the making of architecture as well, like how can they be part of the, uh, of the crafting of that building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, it really would be helpful, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And anyone else? Mm -hmm. Jason, maybe you, is, if there's another question online, yeah. Uh, yes, there's an other question. There are a few more questions from the Zoom. Um, let me find it. We have a question from Justin Law, who's asking if you could explain how you strike a balance between your historical and cultural context-based approach to design and the inelastic demands of, say, square footage demands, building ordinances, et cetera. Uh, between the uh, historical and the, the I'm sorry, the historical yeah. slash cultural context based designs, I suppose the kind of cultural approach to design versus some of the um, the restrictions, the potential restrictions or uh, the bureaucratic mechanisms such as square footage demands, ordinances, building codes, and so on about striking that balance. Um, how do we strike the balance? I think uh, like we're doing with the studio, actually, <laughs> we're, we're trying to like have this kind of research and, and uh, the, I think the building regulation and the problem like the, uh, uh, that's the, the, the issues of budgets and all the constraints of a project, the technical constraints of a project, all these are part of the uh, field of uh, making of architecture. So uh, it is like, it, it's not a sketch that we try to just uh, realize and then we find the material of it. It is sketch that is adjoined with the materiality, adjoined with a building regulation reality, with a budget reality, with an engineering uh, uh, like uh, constraint, with a seismic zone, with uh, with a very demanding client, uh, with a city that imposes uh, a lot of density for a certain construction. So it's it's like uh, drawing on the capacity of bringing these uh, complex fields into a physical matter. And I think the like moving constantly between physical and uh, uh, givens, theoretical and uh, immaterial givens, and trying to see how these could become architecture or how do you take position to these. Thanks. Uh, there's another hand in the front row. You have the mic. Yeah. Hi, Lena. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for an interesting presentation. We, um, yeah. Um, and I just want to kind of follow up on the aspect of sustainability. A lot of um, architecture or construction company in the 21st century focus on sustainability in the immediate or I guess the 25 to 50 years presence. Um, I really enjoy the, your Beirut Tower, and it appears that it does address the the kind of long term urban intensification of, like aspect of it. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, what was, what is your take on sustainability in like the kind of long term scenario, and what if there's like 
like knock on wood, but what if there's like another explosion or earthquake that happens in Beirut? How does your project or um, your current practice address these kind of unforeseeable um, natural disaster or event? Thank you. I have a big responsibility here. <laughs> um, but I think like, I mean, the design specifically of that small, modest building, because it's really small, you have to see the towers behind it uh, and the photos, but uh, is really to uh, be a building that uh, sustain a seismic zone because Beirut is a seismic country. So it was designed as such actually, and it's designed to without any addition, without any cladding. So in a way, because we didn't have a lot of budget actually to have a lot of cladding on the building. Building. So we try to use the means that are present in place. Um, how to address like uh, questions of sustainability? I think uh, sustainability is a large sense because it's about relating uh, to the environment being the lowest impact uh, to the environment in a sense because you do impact the environment when you build, but you just measure your impact in a in a more circular manner to be to. Uh, compensate when you, you build. Uh, here in Beirut, we're in a seismic zone, so it's a concrete building, so uh, building in concrete, but maybe trying to consume less energy by not opening all the building with the complete glass everywhere. So thinking like in a relational manner, not in a mono, let's say, uh, founded way. Uh, and um, and in a way, you're also thinking about the well-being uh, as part of the sustainable uh, construction of a uh, of a building. Like how 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 do you create a belonging to a place? A re respect also uh, to your context. How do you reinstigate this desire to construct uh, uh, by the constructor that you're not just part of an industry, but you're there is a pleasure in constructing and putting in a, a brick together, or like being part of uh, the the act of building an environment that allows people to be better together. Let's say. And I think as architects, we cannot neither be uh, saviors of the, of the world, unfortunately. We have our own means and we try to make the best out of it. How can we like react as after an earthquake is uh, by putting on questions, by trying to, to build in a more conscious way, uh, how to be more involved in moments of urgencies as well by thinking of a disaster place, how to make, uh, like, give knowledge actually to uh, a community to build in a better way. So, I don't know if I replied yeah. to the question. I, you, you're our student, yeah. So, Andrew. I, yeah. Your student, yeah. So I he's not my student, but I, almost I see him yeah. quite often. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's it. I if I could also contribute yeah, to please. to yeah. answering this question because I think it's a very relevant one, especially in the context of what's happening uh, today, not only in the Ukraine but around the world. Um. So. I, I will say something, and it, 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 it came out of a conversation, again, I had with some of the Ukrainian students, is that as architects, we may not always be able to prevent a war, but we should be there to rebuild it. And if you look into the cyclical nature of world history, after natural and man-made disasters, there's always a rebirth, there's always a reconstruction. And I hope that could be something that can give you, especially all of the students, um, uh, courage and the energy and the sense of purpose to do fantastically well in your classes, learn everything that you can, become really powerful and knowledgeable individuals, whether um, it is through architecture or through other professions. Um, it's, it's through your future efforts as citizens of this city, as a citizens of other cities that you will call home, um, and to be able to contribute to it. And I think, you know, as architects, at least our generation, we always said that it's um, 
you almost have to be blindly optimistic to be an architect. Um, it's very difficult for a, a pessimist to be an architect because it is so challenging, you know, going back to uh, how, you know, you're- It's a beautifully challenging. But it's a beautiful challenge. To, and yeah, yeah, and you know, that question that was like, yeah. how do you square the desire to create culturally significant and handcrafted um, buildings at the same time, um, balancing with budget and regulation and, and things. Um, I, I want to say that's what architecture is. That's what design is. Is yeah. not about um, making something easy. <laughs> right? You know, every every single piece of design, every single piece of building is is a battle in in whichever context it might be. Yeah. yeah. So you know we the. The, there will be things that happen in the world, and um, I, I think we, you can contribute to it by being a great student today and yeah. a greater architect tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think like the finding the the meaning actually like uh, building in a meaningful way and uh, questioning like w when we are faced with all what we are faced in today actually what would be your role and how how with all like as a, as a practice and as as an education that brings so much different fields together because you have to learn uh, science you have to learn physics you have to learn the the, the quality of materials the history and that's wonderful that so you're able to really take from what's happening in the world and to question and to contribute in a much more critical and informed way so how do you contribute how do you contribute differently how do how do we shape better the world and we are able to shape it in a better way so. yeah well on that i thank you so much <laughs> thank you Uh, thank you so much for for this conversation. I um, so Lena is going to continue, and then she's going to come back for the the final reviews. And I, for those who are faculty members and students, there'll be future possibilities to to engage to engage with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, so much. Thank you for all. Yeah. So I, I, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending this lecture. Thank you for being a fantastic first physical audience in this room in two years for a public lecture. So this is a really good, uh, a good start. And I also want to thank everyone for joining us online and contributing, especially questions and thoughts. Um, I would like to inform you that the next event in the Daniels faculty winter 2022 public program is called after concrete lena after concrete. yes <laughs> i hope you're tuning in after <laughs> bricks uh, so it will be called after concrete and it's going to be an exciting discussion uh continuing some actually some s similar themes uh that we started today and that will be on tuesday march 29th at 12 p.m eastern time so it will be a lunchtime event and i hope all of you I will be able to join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>